six. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, contrary to um, this notice, I'm not Seth Harris. Um, I'm actually Caroline Fredrickson. I'm the executive director of the American Constitution Society for Law and Policy, otherwise known as ACS. Those of you who are unfamiliar with ACS, uh, we are a national network of lawyers, law students, policymakers, and judges dedicated to promoting the vitality of the U.S. Constitution and the fundamental values it expresses. Individual rights and liberties, genuine equality, access to justice, democracy, and the rule of law. I'd like to thank EPI uh, for letting us use this wonderful venue, which I think is particularly appropriate for today's event. Today's discussions occur in the context of numerous historical markers, most notable of which is the 75th anniversary of the National Labor Relations Act. This event gives us a moment to pause to consider not only the act's importance, but the functioning of the National Labor Relations Board, and more broadly, how the board fits into a larger mosaic of entities, including the Department of Justice and the Department of Labor, that play a role in protecting workers' rights. And that is why we are so incredibly fortunate to have with us today the Deputy Secretary of Labor, Seth Harris. Seth has a, quite a busy schedule, as you can imagine, running such an enormous organization. Um, so I'm going to be very brief in my introduction. Seth was sworn in as Deputy Secretary of Labor on May 26, 2009. Prior to joining the Department of Labor, Seth was a professor of law at New York Law School and director of its labor and employment law programs. Prior to his work at New York Law School, Seth spent seven years at the Department of Labor during the Clinton administration, spanning the tenure of Secretaries Robert Reich and Alexis Herman. During this time, Seth served as counselor to the Secretary of Labor and as acting assistant Secretary of Labor for Policy, among other positions. We are very, very fortunate to have him here today. Seth. <laughs> Thank you very much, um, and thank you so much to the members of the American Constitution. Let me just tell you that when you go to Deputy Secretary School, the first thing they tell you is to button your jacket whenever you give a speech. I don't know why that is. Uh, I'm so delighted to be here with the American Constitution Society. I'm, I'm a tremendous fan of uh, your work, and I'm honored to be a part of this, uh, this um, conference today. Uh, and let me say I'm especially delighted to be included among this distinguished group of friends and uh, fellow labor law scholars and noted practitioners, uh, uh, my friend Jim Brudney, uh, who was a tremendous uh, mentor to me as I entered law teaching, uh, my co-author, Anne-Marie Lafasso, uh, and Dennis Walsh, uh, for, who's uh, one of the most important figures, modern figures in, in modern labor law, and Marshall Babson, of course. Thank you very much, Marshall, for being here. Um, as Carolyn was nice enough to say, prior to becoming uh, the Deputy Secretary of Labor, I taught labor law at New York Law School in New York City, and I'm proud to say that uh, one of New York Law School's most distinguished alums uh, was Senator Robert Wagner, uh, the author and the driving force behind the National Labor Relations Act. Uh, in fact, the cognoscenti in the room will know that the National Labor Relations Act is most commonly known as the Wagner Act. Um, the NLRA remains one of the most remarkable accomplishments of an era of government innovation that saved and shaped the modern American economy <clears throat> and defined liberal democratic capitalism for generations. But on its uh, 75th birthday, we must acknowledge that the National Labor Relations Act that Senator Wagner envisioned is not the NLRA we have today. My former colleague, Harry Wellington, who was one of the, most, one of the earliest and most important scholars of American labor law, attended one of my labor law classes early in my career to offer a mentor's advice about law teaching, and Harry hadn't taught labor law in many years, so he, was, he told me he was looking forward to the experience. Uh, but at the end of the class, he was, I think it's fair to say, surprised and bemused, and I think a little bit disappointed, and that might have had something to do with my teaching, <laughs> but more seriously, I, it was something more. When did labor law become like the tax code, he asked me. Every imaginable activity is regulated, he said. And he was right. And therein lies the irony and the great challenge 
of the National Labor Relations Act on its 75th birthday. Senator Wagner sponsored the NLRA to facilitate a system of private governance of the workplace. Workers, perhaps with advice from union organizers, would choose whether they wanted a union. And then through their union, workers would use their aggregated bargaining power to win better wages and working conditions from their employers. Government would have no role in setting wages. Government would not define the terms and conditions codified in a collective bargaining agreement, except in the most limited of circumstances. And government would not decide for workers whether they would be represented by a union. Employers and their employees, through their unions, would address the biggest issues in the workplace. In this fundamental way, the NLRA differs from its New Deal cousin, the Fair Labor Standards Act. The FLSA imposes a national, government-enforced, uniform minimum wage and a fixed, if soft, ceiling on overtime. It's a one-size-fits-almost-all law. The NLRA, by contrast, doesn't dictate results. It establishes processes. It facilitates flexible problem solving through negotiation. And it puts governance in the hands of the governed, employees and employers, and trusts them to resolve their disputes. The NLRA doesn't promise that dispute resolution will always be pretty. Democracy rarely is. But the NLRA contemplates a decentralized, diverse, flexible, problem-solving approach to the day-to-day -day interactions between employers and their employees. Bargaining power would decide the content of collective bargaining agreements, not government-defined rules. Yet 75 years after Senator Wagner persuaded the New Deal Congress to adopt the NLRA, it is the exceptional case where a private sector worker can band together with her co-workers to bargain for higher wages or improved health care or an employer-provided pension. As I'm sure this distinguished panel is going to talk about in some great detail, only 7% of private sector workers are currently represented by unions. And it's the rare workplace that's governed through a private system of problem-solving collective bargaining and grievance adjustment. One very important reason for the decline in union density is the phenomenon Harry Wellington identified when he was sitting in my labor law class several years ago. Dense layers of detailed organizing and representation rules have been piled on top of the NLRA by the Supreme Court and lower courts. The law has become encrusted or ossified, as our friend Cindy Esland famously put it. Litigation has too often replaced private conflict resolution. That's not the system that Senator Wagner had in mind. Senator Wagner was motivated by values that I believe remain core American values to this day. We still want workers' wages to rise and for income inequality to narrow. We still, want worker, we still don't want workers cheated out of their hard-earned pay or benefits. We want workers to have safe, healthy, and fair workplaces. We want workers to have health care and retirement security. And when there is unfairness or just some everyday issue seeking resolution, we want workers to have a voice in their workplaces. At the Labor Department, we view these values as the very definition of a good job. Senator Wagner believed that failure to realize these values, the failure to assure good jobs, would threaten industrial peace. He had seen it during his service alongside Francis Perkins on New York's Industrial Commission and through the six years of the Great Depression that preceded the passage of the National Labor Relations Act. So Senator Wagner constructed a system by which our society could achieve these results through collective bargaining. Now encrusted and ossified, this system leaves nine out of 10 workers without a private means of resolving their workplace problems. Understandably, workers have turned to their government. Over the past 40 years, because of irresistible public demands for action, Congress has stepped in to regulate workplace safety and health, health care and pensions, family and medical leave, civil rights for workers of color and women workers and workers with disabilities, and a host of other workplace issues. And some states have done even more. Instead of a private government governance system where organized workers and their employers apply flexible solutions 
to workplace challenges at their source, our society has increasingly called upon government to solve these problems with broadly applicable and largely inflexible rules and command and control enforcement regimes. The model codified in the Fair Labor Standards Act is now the norm, rather than the model promoted by Senator Wagner in the National Labor Relations Act. Now when you hear government, you should think Labor Department, because much of this responsibility has fallen to us. And so the decline of Senator Wagner's model of a private workplace governance system means that the demands on the Labor Department have grown. Certainly, Secretary Solis and I, along with our entire leadership team, are committed to these values. But the size of the demand far outstrips our available resources. The Labor Department has a few thousand inspectors struggling to enforce dozens of employment laws, protecting 140 million workers in some 9 million workplaces. Our inspectors cannot be in every part of every workplace every day. It isn't possible, and it isn't the system we want. Fortunately, many employers and other regulated, regulated entities have a culture of compliance. We don't need to send enforcement personnel to their workplaces to force compliance. They obey the law as a part of their business model. Some employers and others have difficulty complying because they lack an understanding of the laws and regulations that govern America's workplaces. For them, the Labor Department provides extensive compliance assistance materials on its website and in print. In fact, some of our agencies even send consulting teams to workplaces to help employers figure out how to comply. So for those who need help understanding their responsibilities, our educational efforts should be sufficient to achieve compliance. But there are other employers and enterprises regulated by the Labor Department. They depend on luck or coincidence to avoid the violation of workers' rights, or perhaps worse, they make a calculated decision whether to comply with employment laws. They assess the benefits of refusing to comply with the law and compare them to the costs of complying with the law, and then they weigh these costs and benefits against the likelihood that they'll be caught and then the penalty if they are caught. These employers wait to see if Labor Department enforcement personnel will intervene to force compliance rather than taking the responsibility to comply on their own. They're playing a dangerous game of catch me if you can, and they are putting workers' rights, even their lives, at risk. We can't abide an economic calculus that exploits the fact that the Labor Department cannot and should not look over every shoulder. So we've launched a new strategy. A new tool will add to the toolbox used by the Labor Department's worker protection agencies. We call it Plan, Prevent, Protect. The goal is very simple. Plan, Prevent, Protect aims to change the calculus so that employers and other entities regulated by the Labor Department will take responsibility for employment law compliance. This is our best bet of leveraging limited resources while still responding to the rising demand for Labor Department involvement in employment law disputes. Although the specifics will vary by law, industry, and regulated entity, this plan, prevent, protect strategy will require regulated entities to take three steps to ensure compliance with the laws we administer. Plan means that we'll propose to require employers and other regulated entities to create a plan to find and fix violations of the law and other risks to workers. And they must involve their employees in the creation of that plan. Prevent means we will propose to require employers and others to thoroughly implement their plans in a manner that actually prevents violations of the law and other risks and hazards. Protect means we'll propose to require that employers and others assure that the plan does what it's supposed to do, protect workers. Employers who fail to take the plan, prevent, protect steps will be considered out of compliance with the law and depending upon the agency may experience a remedial action. It's not a panacea for all the risks, hazards, and inequities in the workplace. There are employers and others in our regulated communities 
that are simply chronic scoff laws. But employers and others who follow the department's plan, prevent, protect strategy will assure compliance before Labor Department enforcement personnel arrive at their doorsteps. And most important, they'll assure that workers get the safe and healthy, diverse, family-friendly, and fair workplaces our society has promised. The need for plan, prevent, protect arises directly out of the shrinking scope of the private system of workplace governance that Senator Wagner sought to establish with the NLRA. Of course, the Labor Department cannot replace collective bargaining with a regulation or an enforcement action, nor are we trying to do so with a plan, prevent, protect strategy. Only Congress and the National Labor Relations Board can regulate labor management relations in the private sector. Nonetheless, in many organized workplaces, there are grievance mechanisms and bargaining relationships that address safety and health and wages and benefits and family leave and workplace discrimination. Problems are addressed at their source and workers and their unions become their own enforcement personnel even if they are enforcing a contract rather than a statute. They're not always perfect and we need government employment law enforcement as a backstop to private dispute resolution, but the need for government to look over every shoulder becomes less pressing when workers can look out for themselves. Speaking for the Labor Department, we are doing and will continue to do our very best to vindicate workers' rights in an informed and effective way. But Labor Department enforcement personnel cannot be expected to know as much about any particular workplace as frontline workers and their managers. And without detailed knowledge, it's difficult to make nuanced and individualized judgments about how an employee should relate to an employer. A better system would establish a balance. The system of private workplace governance and dispute resolution that Senator Robert Wagner envisioned combined with government enforcement of progressive employment laws when private dispute resolution does not serve the values Congress has codified. On this 75th anniversary of the National Labor Relations Act, we must ask ourselves how we can realize that balance, how we can rededicate ourselves to Senator Wagner's vision, and how we can modernize and reform American labor law to assure that workers have a genuine opportunity to bargain with their employers and solve problems where they should be solved in their workplaces. So thank you again to the American Constitution Society for inviting me to be with you today, and thank you so much for your attention. Am I, am I, I'm moderating my own question and answer period, apparently. So any uh, questions or comments, rebuttals, suggestions? I used to joke with my students that if there were no questions, it showed either that I had given the perfect teaching presentation or that I had so confused them they couldn't even formulate a question. So I don't know which one it is today. Yes, sir. Wait for the microphone. And if you could identify yourself for me, that would be great. Sure. I'm Steve Hightop. I'm the general counsel for the Coalition of Immokalee Workers, actually, where the secretary is today, as we speak. She is indeed. She's at, in Florida with the Immokalee <laughs> Workers today. She is indeed. And I'm just looking for some clarification of the um, taxonomy that you described. Um, assuming this, this pool of um, scoff laws and then a pool of people who will participate in the plan, um, prevent and protect, if people are participating in the um, 3P program, but don't succeed, would that then make them more likely to be looked at by the department for an enforcement action, or will the um, enforcement um, will the enforcement arm be looking at this sort of scoff law reservoir that doesn't even participate in the program, or both? I guess um, that's a very good question. Thank you for that question. The uh, part of the task for our uh, worker protection agencies is to target their resources where intervention, direct governmental intervention, is needed most. So in, in an ideal world, you would be focusing on the most egregious employers, these chronic scoff laws, the, some, of what, some of the behavior, frankly, that we saw that led to the, the disaster, the 
catastrophe at the Upper Big Branch Mine in West Virginia where 29 miners were killed. You know, serious violation after serious violation where we would intervene, they would abate, and then they would violate again. And we would intervene, and they would abate, and then they would violate again. Over 515 times in 2009. So that's really where we want to be able to focus our resources. Plan, prevent, protect is going to require us to also intervene at the planning and implementation stage because we, our expectation is that some number of employers uh, will engage in this planning. Let me just say some employers, including some very large employers, are already doing this. They have safety and health plans. They have safety and health committees. They implement. They have low uh, uh, injury and illness rates in their workplaces, low fatality rates as a result because they take responsibility put these plans in place, assess their effectiveness, and, and improve them over the course of time. Some number of employers, particularly early on, will need us to intervene to assure that they are engaging in these three steps, planning, preventing, and protecting. Over time, my hope is that that pool will shrink and we'll have many, many more employers and other regulated entities engaging in this responsible behavior and that we will again be able to focus our re resources overwhelmingly on the chronic scoff laws, the egregious violators. Uh, but our plan is not simply to ask for plans, not simply to say, hey, it would be nice if you planned. That's going to become a part of our enforcement regime because there is a, employ there's a lot of evidence that shows that employers who plan in advance to avoid violations, in fact, avoid those violations. And we want them to get into a virtuous cycle, plan, implement, assess whether you're being effective, and if you're not being effective, change the plan, implement again, and get to the point where you're actually assuring that workers' rights are being vindicated. Other comments or questions? Yes, sir. What is Tell me who you are, if you would. To what extent is the department interacting with the Department of Homeland Security and ICE with respect to undocumented workers and to workplaces where undocumented workers are concentrated? Um, I'm, I'm going to narrow your question because it's so broad that I don't want to suggest that we are in any way coordinating when it comes to worksite enforcement. <clears throat> ICE does what ICE is going to do. We do what we're going to do. We are, however, in extensive discussions with ICE about how to move forward in our relationship in a way that assures that employers who are ex exploiting undocumented workers um, are not getting an advantage in the marketplace. So we view worksite enforcement of employment laws as being a critical tool in trying to address that problem, um, but we don't want to get caught up in seeming to be focused on exporting undocumented uh, workers out of the country. That would get in the way of our accomplishing our mission. But we're in extensive discussions with ICE and others at DHS about how to make that come out right um, sort of without coordinating, figuring out a way to work on parallel paths. Yes, ma'am. Susan McGulrick with Daily Labor Report. I'll say it again. Susan McGulrick with Daily Labor Report. So the PPP plan applies to all areas, not just um, worker safety and health. We're, we're Can you give an example in, like in the area of wage and hour? Sure, I'd be happy to, and thank you for that question, so it allows me to clarify a little bit. Um, the, the, the paradigmatic, sorry, sounding like a, well, I'm really sounding like a law professor, the paradigm, oh my goodness. Um, I don't know another word for that. I've forgotten my, what words work there. Um, the best example, <laughs> the best example is in the safety and health world. So both OSHA and MSHA are going to establish regulations, or are proposing regulations, I should say, um, that will require employers to, to create injury and illness prevention plans, or safety and health programs, um, that are essentially will require employers to find and fix violations before they rise to the level of Labor Department intervention. Um, and there are other regulations as well that OSHA and MSHA are focusing on. They have, uh, OSHA is going to propose a regulation requiring that uh, uh, institutions where you have infectious diseases, hospitals, nursing homes, other places, have a plan to avoid workers uh, experiencing these infectious diseases. Uh, MSHA is going to propose a plan that's going to require pre-shift inspections 
by employers in mines, in underground mines. But we also uh, have Wage and Hour and the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Programs involved in this way. One of the areas in which we're going to apply this concept is with respect to the misclassification of workers. Um, a, a problem around the country in a bunch of industries, construction being one, but not the only one, where employers simply opt workers out of employment law and tax law coverage by saying, oh, you're an independent contractor, you're not an employee. And what we're saying is, no, 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 you can't simply declare it. You can't wave your hand and say that a group of workers is no longer covered by the law. Now you've got to do some planning, you've got to do some analysis, and you've got to actually disclose that analysis to the worker. So Wage and Hour is, produ is a pr going to propose a rule having to do with Fair Labor Standards Act record keeping. And what that rule will require is that employers, before they say that a worker is not a covered employee under the law, under the Fair Labor Standards Act, that they uh, perform the requisite legal analysis to show that they are not an employee and there are well-established rules. They have to disclose that analysis to the worker. They have to keep it in their files in case wage and hour investigators ever show up at the workplace. And through that system, the worker will be empowered to say, hey, wait a minute, this, this description of my job responsibilities, that's not right. I should be an employee. Or for the worker to go to the wage and hour division and say, wait a minute, this is not right. I'm getting cheated out of my wages. Or even to go and get a private lawyer. So that's what the, the, FL, that's what the wage and hour division is doing. Both OFCCP and OSHA are going to do the same thing. In rules that they are working on, they're going to do the same thing under the laws that they enforce. And that way, around the country, employers will have to do a little bit more work. They'll have to plan. They'll have to protect through analysis or prevent through analysis and then actually protect workers from being misclassified. We think that the result of that is that, that hundreds of thousands, hopefully hundreds of thousands of workers who are now being deprived of basic wage and overtime protections are going to end up being covered. Thank you, Seth. Thank you very Thank you much. Very Thanks much. again. I think we all very much appreciated um, Seth's remarks, and, and thank you all um, for, um, for coming today and for the questions that you asked. <coughs> now I'm going to introduce our panel. The National Labor Relations Act at 75, looking back and looking forward. On July 5th of 1935, President Franklin D. Roosevelt signed the National Labor Relations Act into law. As the 75th anniversary approaches, we must take the time to consider both its legacy and its future. How has the NLRA protected workers' rights? In what ways does its promise remain unfulfilled? What statutory, structural, or administrative reforms might be recommended to improve the NLRA or the functioning of the National Labor Relations Board? We are very, very fortunate today to have a panel made up of former NLRB members and scholars to discuss these and other questions. Our moderator will introduce each panelist, but I have the honor of in introducing our moderator, Professor Anne Lafazzo. Anne is a professor of law at West Virginia University College of Law, where she teaches courses in employment and labor law, as well as law and economics. She began her legal career in private practice at New York's Milbank Tweed, Hadley and McCloy, and from Milbank, she went on to the NLRB, where she spent 10 years litigating cases before the U.S. Courts of Appeal and advising the, solicitor, the Office of the Solicitor General on labor-related issues in cases where the United States filed amicus briefs before the Supreme Court. So Anne is obviously very well qualified to lead today's discussion, and I will now turn it over to her. Thank you. Thank you, Caroline. I, I'll stay here for the panel. Um, 75 years ago, we know that Congress passed the National Labor Relations Act as part of President Roosevelt's New Deal. 
The act affirmatively established in a law of general applicability a worker's fundamental right to self-organize, to form, join, and assist unions, to bargain collectively through representatives chosen either through secret ballot elections or through card checks, to band together for mutual aid or protection, and of course, the later amended right to refrain from any of those activities. The American Constitution Society asks this distinguished panel to pause on this anniversary to reflect on the act's legacy and to discuss its future. Much has been written about the National Labor Relations Act and that future. Indeed, modern labor law scholarship is fraught with prognostications of the act's demise, a fortune fueled most recently with the Supreme, when the Supreme Court granted certiorari a new process, a case which promises to tell us whether the for, former two-member board even had authority to issue cases for the last two of those 75 years. The National Labor Relations Act has had a significant place in American legal history, which is why its future is important, not just to labor scholars and practitioners, but to all who care about the rule of law and the modern administrative state. It is not a coincidence that the National Labor Relations Board has been party to many of the most important Supreme Court cases to establish significant administrative law principles. And even in cases where the NLRB has not been a party, the board, as one of the few administrative agencies to routinely rely upon adjudication to create and apply legal principles has reaffirmed those administrative principles in the adjudicatory context. And so the National Labor Relations Board and Article III courts through administrative adjudication and court litigation have firmly established significant administrative principles such as the controversial doctrine of non-acquiescence whereby an administrative agency, primarily the National Labor Relations Board, may lawfully continue to follow its own legal precedent, even in the face of court review with hostile in-circuit precedent. Reviewing courts have also imposed on the board the Chenery Doctrine, developed in a context of another administrative agency. Under the Chenery Doctrine, reviewing courts demand administrative agencies, such as the National Labor Relations Board, to engage in rational decision making and therefore demand agencies to give principled justifications before changing their legal precedents. But perhaps the single most important administrative principle to develop is the principle of Chevron deference. All administrative agencies are charged by Congress with administering specific statutes and all agencies are required to give those statutes their plain meaning. But many times, there are ambiguities or gaps in the statutory language. Under Chevron, reviewing courts who function normally to, is to interpret law must defer to an agency's permissible, reasonable, and constitutional constructions of the ambiguous statutory language and silent gaps. Accordingly, reviewing courts must defer to the NLRB's reasonable interpretations of amb ambiguous language or gaps in the NLRA. From these principles directly follows the lawful practice of oscillation, whereby the National Labor Relations Board typically changes its legal principles in controversial areas with a change in the political composition of the National Labor Relations Board, resulting directly from a change in political party power at the national level. While some praise this practice as being democratically responsive to the electorate, many condemn it as injecting too much instability in the law. Along these lines, critics point out that the democracy, the democracy argument has no force in national elections in which labor law is never the determinative issue. Others, such as NYU law professor Cynthia Esland, has pointed out that labor law has, in fact, been so isolated from democratic experimentation, innovation, and renewal as to, as Seth also um, pointed out, ossify labor law, which is where we are today. Those hopeful that the NLRB might fulfill the promises of Section 7 have felt empty-handed. Indeed, some are so disheartened as to suggest wholesale change, such as statutory amendment. But the political gridlock on labor issues for the past half century, coupled with a radically changing economic landscape, have led many to search for a change from within the agency itself. Sam S. Stryker and others have suggested rulemaking as a way of injecting stability back into, the lab into labor law. But would rulemaking lead to further ossification? Is there a way to accomplish rulemaking that would not lead to ossification? 
Others, most notably Ellen Dannon, have suggested changes within extant board law by encouraging board attorneys in the regions to pursue a more civil rights-based litigation strategy supported by sociological data to fulfill the promises of Section 7. Regardless of where we come out on these solutions, just as the history of labor law must be viewed through the administrative lens, so must its future. And to reflect on the Act's legacy and discuss its future, I present to you this panel, this distinguished panel of three speakers. Our first speaker is Professor James Brudney, who teaches labor and employment law at The Ohio State University. Professor Brudney had a distinguished career of government service and private practice before entering the world of academia. Following graduation from Yale Law School, Professor Brudney clerked for a district court judge in Washington, D.C., and subsequently for Justice Harry A. Blackmun of the United States Supreme Court. He then spent the next 10 years practicing labor and employment law, first as a lawyer for the prestigious firm of Bredhoff and Kaiser here in Washington, and then as chief counsel and staff director of the Senate Subcommittee on Labor. We will next hear from the Honorable Dennis Walsh. A graduate of Yale, of, sorry, of Cornell Law School, Mr. Walsh began his career <laughs> with the, Mr. Walsh began his career with the NLRB where he has held numerous positions before eventually being appointed board member on three occasions between 2000 and 2007. Mr. Walsh teaches labor law at Howard University School of Law and is currently the Deputy General, General Counsel of the Federal Labor Relations Authority. Our final speaker is another former board member, the Honorable Marshall B. Babson. Marshall Babson is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania and Cornell Law School. In 1985, President Reagan appointed Mr. Babson to the National Labor Relations Board as a board member. Building on his already national reputation, former member Babson continues to be recognized as one of the very best management side labor lawyers in the country and the world. Former member Babson is currently a partner at Hughes, Hubbard & Reed in New York. Each speaker will present for about seven minutes. I will then lead a 20 to 25 minute discussion among the panelists before turning over the discussion to the audience for the final 20 to 25 minutes. With that, we will hear from our first distinguished panelist, Professor James Brudney. Thank you, Anne. People can hear me? Um, <clears throat> thanks so much to ACS uh, for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here and especially uh, to be in the company of these two esteemed former board members. Um, <clears throat> as the academic on our panel, I have been chosen to provide an overview or, if you will, the long view uh, about the National Labor Relations Act. Uh, and to paraphrase and perhaps uh, somewhat debase uh, Shakespeare's Mark Antony, uh, I am here before you to praise the NLRA more than to bury it. <laughs> um, when the Wagner Act uh, became law in 1935, it helped to dismantle a long-standing common law system of employer-employee relations based on the master-servant doctrine. It's worth recalling the truly radical nature of Section 7 protecting the right to engage in concerted activity for, mutu for mutual aid and protection. That provision and its enforceability through what is now Section 8A cut back significantly on employers' unilateral authority <clears throat> to make all basic managerial decisions. Uh, that in turn allowed for statutorily encouraged uh, and monitored a negotiation of collective bargaining agreements that became a centerpiece for the American labor movement featuring just cause provisions, seniority clauses, prohibiting arbitrary or bad faith conduct on the part of employers, as well as grievance and arbitration procedures <clears throat> that create affordable forms of workplace-centered due process. All of this helped to bring a measure of <clears throat> stability and order to employer-employee relations during a period uh, that had been preceded by high instability and even occasional violence in the 1930s. Uh, the act was never perfect, uh, certainly not from labor's perspective. Uh, in its initial interpretations, uh, the Supreme Court construed contested provisions to impose substantial constraints on the right to strike, as well as on the scope of employers' duty to bargain in good faith. And Congress subsequently limited the position of unions in various ways when it enacted uh, Taft-Hartley in 1947. 
Still, the act functioned, uh, I would say, reasonably well into the late 1960s. Uh, some critics, particularly in the academic uh, community, suggest there was never a golden age for the National Labor Relations Act. Uh, I tend to disagree. I think that the 1960s, or a substantial part of them, might qualify in terms of our legal system's overall perspective on group action as the central theme of <clears throat> labor relations policy. During that decade, the Supreme Court, in a dozen or more decisions, uh, honored the core value of concerted activity, conferred broad protection against sophisticated employer efforts to chill group action through threats, through promised benefits, or through discriminatory self-help strategies, uh, and also repeatedly recognized uh, the importance uh, of collective bargaining processes by prohibiting employers from altering working conditions without first bargaining, by requiring employers to bargain about certain entrepreneurial decisions, and by authorizing the board to order bargaining when extreme employer misconduct undermined <coughs> a union election. Since 1970, though, uh, there's been a series of what I would call interrelated erosions in the force and reach of the act. Uh, the court has issued several major decisions expressing a diminished commitment to group action and collective bargaining. The board overall has fared far worse before the court on cases involving employer liability uh, under Section 8A than it did before 1970. Uh, between 1939 and 1970, it won roughly four-fifths of its 8A cases in front of the Supreme Court. Since 1970, it's won just over one-half. Uh, moreover, the circuit courts uh, have developed a distrust for group action that was not present during earlier periods under the Act, or at least not to the same extent. And probably most important, Congress has largely abandoned uh, group action as Deputy Secretary Harris suggested, as a means of regulating the workplace. It has focused instead from the mid-1960s onward on anti-discrimination law and minimum standards laws that offer protection for individual employees on an individually enforceable basis. Uh, I don't mean to suggest <clears throat> that the legal system is the primary cause for declining rates of union density in the private sector. An ample number of economic factors are of overarching significance. But the failure to revisit and update the National Labor Relations Act uh, and the related shift in orientation of our legal system are important contributing factors. Uh, there is no other regulatory regime in this country, and I want you to think about telecommunications, environment, securities, banking, education, health care, uh, about which one could say Congress has made no important changes and virtually no changes since Jackie Robinson integrated baseball or since before the advent of the interstate highway system. This legislative rigidity, ossification may be too complimentary a term, uh, has placed uh, enormous and unfair pressure on the board to become the policymaking body in the arena of labor management relations to update the act so that it is more relevant in a post-industrial 21st century economy. That pressure has been magnified by developments since the mid-1990s, showing how employees and unions have largely lost faith in the act itself. There's been a surge of private sector union organizing in the past 15 years, but much of it has involved neutrality agreements and related efforts to contract around the NLRB's election processes. One remarkable fact is that the constituency that it objected most passionately to the NLRA in 1935, the American business community, is most prominent, some would say virtually alone, in defending the act as a regulatory arrangement today. Uh, but whoever said life is unfair was absolutely right. Uh, the board has been dealt these cards, and so it has no real choice but to play them. Uh, in this 75th anniversary year, uh, the board must take on the challenge of updating the act, making it more effective and meaningful for constituencies that believed in it for decades but have lost so much faith in recent years. My personal view is that Congress should be addressing these issues first and foremost, but I see little prospect for that in the immediate future. 
And since I am running out of time, I want to end by suggesting uh, a few areas where I believe the Board could better fulfill the Act's promise while staying well within the law as it currently exists. And I look forward to discussing these and other ideas in our question and answer session. And I'll just give you three. First, the Board could use its Section 9 authority under General Hsu and the Laboratory Conditions Doctrine to provide unions with access to employees at the work site, paralleling how unions have been negotiating for such access with employers as part of neutrality agreements. Second, the Board could use its Section 10C authority, consistent with both Phelps Dodge and 7-Up Bottling, to impose mandatory minimum back pay awards for wrongful discharges modeled on its well-established efforts in the effects bargaining area under Transmarine. And finally, the Board could develop informal or formal guidance to address the issues of employers classifying or misclassifying their employees as independent contractors by borrowing from other areas of labor law, possibly by borrowing from initiatives such as the one that uh, the Department of Labor is uh, embarked on to define and keep records on the independent contractor relationship. Thanks very much. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, more about process and about what, from my perspective, as a former board member and a former board staff member, uh, what works and what doesn't work at the, at the NLRB. Um, and maybe that will provide some context in terms of discussing the, uh, the uh, policy issues that Professor Brudney has uh, proposed that the board should, um, should, should look into. I almost uh, threw away all my notes when I uh, walked in and saw all of my old friends here who work at the NLRB because uh, there's really nothing that I can tell them about this subject that they don't know already and that they could probably tell you better than I could um, because it's really them that... Um, that do the work of the NLRB, and you know we come and go as uh, political appointees, but they're the ones who do the work. And I'm sort of patting myself on the back there too, because I used to be one of them. But uh, <laughs> um, but um, but anyway, with that caveat, I, I just want to have a few thoughts. Um, yeah. I think uh, as a as a board member coming into the board, as two new board members are now uh, beginning their service. Whether the board works as an institution really uh, honestly depends on your perspective. Um, first of all, it depends on what you think you're there to accomplish. Um, I don't believe that if, if you come in to the board thinking that you're going to make major policy pronouncements or changes in the law, um, you're going to be sorely disappointed. Also, if you're coming in with any kind of agenda like, well, we're going to turn around this 7% uh, union density rate um, as an institution, we're, we're going to be at the forefront of doing that, I think you're going to be disappointed as well. Um, it also depends on your perspective in terms of whether or not what you can accomplish as a board member and as a board um, depends on whether you're in the majority or not. Uh, and I've been in both, so uh, I've seen it from both, uh, both sides. Um, but anyway, uh, just as an example in terms of making major changes, uh, I would cite the, uh, the orders that were issued last week asking for briefing on, on two issues, the, uh, whether or not the board should use compound interest in calculating back pay, and whether or not the board ought to order uh, email or electronic notices. Okay, these are, these are not major areas of the law, but they have been hanging around the board for years. Uh, fairly straightforward issues, um, but only now is the board actually asking for a full briefing from, from the entire community on these issues. So the idea that you could come in and actually make major reforms, I think, is, um, is, is, would be really ill-advised. Um, which, which brings, of course, the, the top, up the topic of rulemaking and why doesn't the board um, use rulemaking to address issues such as these or issues such as uh, Professor Brudney has suggested. Well, I have been through, and many of the staff people here have been through, some rulemaking um, exercises at the board. 
and i think they have the rule making has a lot of advantages in terms of stability of the law in terms of getting everyone's views and so forth but the problem is from the inside the board viewpoint first of all it saps a lot of resources from the adjudication function which they have to perform every day and secondly it automatically makes the board a political magnet as soon as any kind of rule is proposed I mean many of us were there I was there in the 90's when professor Gould's board proposed the single facility appropriate unit rule well we were threatened with 30% cuts in our budget from congress from people who had actually never even heard of the NLRB before many of these congressmen all of a sudden set up and took notice and threatened us with 30% cuts so those are just the difficulties and I think two of the main reasons that the board hasn't used rule making as much as it might have which is not to say that it doesn't have its place and I believe it could be very useful but so what does the board do well well if you come in just from a board member standpoint if you come into the board and if you see your role as helping to develop step by step a particular view of the law number one and deciding cases the cases that are in front of you expeditiously and fairly then I think there is potential for accomplishing a lot at the NLRB like many of the democratic members of the board my view has been that the act is actually intended to encourage collective bargaining and in my own personal view I don't see how you can encourage collective bargaining without fostering and at least providing the legal protection for organizing so I always decided cases with those kinds of principles in mind protecting the right to actually to choose to engage in collective bargaining and once you've chosen it protecting the relationship itself now not every board member that I served with it seemed to me shared this view so it was very important even in dissent to have board members there in my view who do share that view and to help have the opportunity to help to develop that view both in dissent and in the majority and to protect it from attack on the other side but most importantly the board's job is to decide the cases that are presented to it first of all parties expect a resolution of their disputes and in this sense the bulk of the work of the board is actually done in the field because those are the people that are resolving labor disputes every single day but the board does provide a does have a role in that because it's the board's role both to decide the cases and to decide the major issues in a timely manner so that parties will be able to have guidance on what the law is and I think the board does fairly well at those two functions but they could do a lot better and in my view the main problems though are not necessarily structural or administrative they are political and that is that the denomination and appointment process is totally broken and everyone acknowledges this that's not the problem that we don't acknowledge it the problem is that no one seems to want to take any steps to fix it that leads to the fact that we have long term recess appointments long terms without any too many short term board members and too many recess appointments I mean we have a very good group of board members there now but how long are they going to be there two of them have recess appointments until the end of next year unless this appointment process is somehow fixed it's a single group of board members really does not have the chance to make any kind of changes or to set any tone of the law and this of course is what got us into our current legal fix where we had two members for 27 months and we don't even know whether their decisions were valid there are some simple fixes for this one I would suggest is simply statutory have holdover appointments like almost every other agency has but in my view the main the main view the main fix for this has got to be a different viewpoint taken of the board from the political process they have to be they have to look at the nomination and an appointment process from the viewpoint of what is going to help this institution do the job 
not what is going to advance any particular agenda on one side or the other, but what is going to help the institution do the job. And that, that has got to change um, in order for, to help the board actually do what it's supposed to do. Thanks very much. Just a couple of things. Uh, you're, you're showing us, just so I can get the rules straight, you're giving us elapsed time, not the time that's left. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I, I finally figured that out. Not, we just, everybody does it a little bit differently. Um, I'd like to thank ACS very much for inviting me to join you today. It's a, a privilege and a pleasure uh, to be here with uh, friends and colleagues. Uh, I've enjoyed uh, what others have said. <laughs> that usually happens to me. <laughs> um, the, the one thing I just have to say, Anne, I went to Columbia Law School, not oh. to Cornell. I'm sorry. And the only reason I feel some obligation to say that is because you said so many other nice things, and this is, <laughs> this is a reunion year for me, and I don't want to get letters or phone calls from Cornell Law School to go along <laughs> with the phone calls I've been getting from Columbia Law School reminding me that this is my reunion year. Um, but thank you very much for being here. I, I have many thoughts. Uh, I'm looking forward to the discussion that we have. Um, and, and let me try to put out a couple of uh, um, ideas uh, for you to uh, contemplate uh, or consider. I just want to say, uh, first and foremost, I'm not sure that I'm the best or the most representative management spokesperson. Um, I said that uh, at the time that the invitation was extended, so I, I feel I've been forthcoming, but uh, I, I'm not sure I have a typical management uh, approach to this, but uh, this is an area that I take quite seriously. Uh, the time that I served on the board uh, was something that uh, I enjoyed very, very much. It was an extraordinary experience, and uh, like Dennis and the others, I, I just want to recognize we have so many people here from the agency, uh, distinguished union counsel, distinguished management lawyers, and I, and I do look forward to the discussion. But uh, any one of you, I'm sure, will have uh, your own views as well. Um, first, I, I want to say I was struck by Seth Harris and uh, uh, and, and Jim's comments about uh, the purposes of, uh, of the statute. Um, uh, I agree that uh, this is really quite an extraordinary structure that we have uh, in this country. And I may be in a minority, but I've had uh, sufficient, significant enough experience in the last five years of my practice, and I spend most of my time now in private practice representing companies. Uh, I believe that this is a system that can work, uh, that there are people who are willing to allow it to work, and that it indeed not only can it work, but that uh, we have some unexplored opportunities, uh, some of which have been uh, not fostered uh, either purposely or otherwise uh, by the agency. Uh, and there is a lot of potential for people to understand that uh, the managers of enterprises and the workers who make it possible for those uh, enterprises uh, to succeed actually have areas uh, where their interests coincide and that they should work together and can work together uh, to accomplish uh, great objectives and to each his uh, benefit. So, um, I, I will just, I'll give you a very, very quick example of one area that I've worked in quite a bit in the last uh, four or five years, although this work slowed down quite a bit in the last uh, year or two, is in the private equity area. Private equity firms uh, buying and selling businesses, including unionized businesses. And when, uh, when approached, when managers of these enterprises were approached with the question, uh, if this enterprise can succeed, if the productivity can be increased, if uh, some of the uh, areas that have not been successful in the past uh, can be worked through collaboratively by establishing more 
uh, um, cooperative relationships with the union representatives and the workers, are you willing to share, Mr. Owner, uh, in the success of that enterprise? And I'm just telling you now what my experience has been. I have never had a single equity company say to me, no, we're not willing to do it. I mean, as most of you know, uh, in these equity companies and these deals and, and when they were being done, um, the, the purpose was to buy these businesses, to make them more streamlined, to make them more efficient. I know that there's been criticism about the manner in some instances in which that's been done. But the question was, uh, you incentivize management uh, of those enterprises by telling them if you can turn this business around in five years or seven years or ten years at the outset, uh, you are willing to pay them some um, percentage of the of the upside. Are you willing to pay the workers and their representative? I've never had an equity company say no. And we actually had one very big deal involving the auto industry in which uh, a pair of private equity owners uh, indicated that they would pay precisely the same amount of money uh, to the union and the workers that they would pay to, to the management that they were putting in place if this business uh, entity could succeed. So in the two, one minute that I have left, what are one of the questions uh, that, that need to be asked? Well, there are some excellent uh, papers that have been done. Um, I know people have varying views on these things. One that I've consulted freely, and I read it again this morning, I recommend it to you. Uh, Catherine Fisk and Deborah Malamud did a paper in the Duke Law Journal about a year ago called uh, The NLRB in Administrative Law Exile. It was published in May of uh, 2009. The, the notion of the uh, agency being a regulatory agency versus uh, a, an adjudicator simply of rights. Uh, I think that there's some merit to this. I think that there is some merit to the fact that if we simply define the issues or disputes that come before the agency in terms of whose right is this, Jim Brudney, I think, uh, properly uh, talked about access in the work workplace. If we characterize or define this issue in terms of rights, we're going to get into one set of arguments and one set of uh, results. If, on the other hand, we look at this in a more regulatory mode, which is not something that the board has done perhaps as well as it, uh, as it might, uh, then perhaps the disposition uh, of rules or regulations will look differently, and perhaps the interests can be characterized differently. So I have the view, I've spoken on some of these things before, I'm not someone who's particularly uh, a fan of the Dana decision, for example, because I don't believe that that allows uh, the parties to work collaboratively where they choose to do so. If the board were to adopt a more regulatory environment, it seems to me that uh, there are great possibilities. But we have a lot of time uh, between us. There are a lot of interesting issues on the table, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Well, we have about about an hour, actually. So the first 20 to 25, about 25 minutes, we will we'll spend um, with the um, panel responding to each other. I will put out some questions. And then we're going to open it up to, for audience participation. Maybe we'll audit, open it up a little. I know you guys are, are anxious to participate. So, But let me, let me start um, with Professor Brudney, because, just because that's the order in which we went. And perhaps we can just um, get some of the panelists' views on, um, on some of what Professor Brudney's um, specific um, potential solutions were. And perhaps Professor Brudney could elaborate a little bit. He talked about the board using s its Section 9 and Section 10C powers more, and also on dealing uh, with the definition of employee. Um, Jim, do you want to say anything sure. more? I, I could say a little bit. I mean, the the uh, access concept is not original with me. Sam Estreicher has proposed this. Others have been talking about it. Um, in theory, once a union presents uh, its 30 percent card uh, uh, status, um, uh, we're starting an election campaign. And to the extent we're starting an election campaign or the possibility of an election campaign, 
the board section nine authority becomes relevant in the same way it did under excel sure five decades ago four decades ago four plus decades ago um and so the question is whether um uh one could imagine the board using those section nine powers uh since the supreme court in lechmere has made it clear that they can't use their section eight authority in this regard and that's that's what the law is unless and until congress changes it which seems unlikely um uh to do something like guaranteeing uh, uh one uh, large meeting on site for union and one uh, set of individual one-on-one -on -one meetings uh, uh, with employees who have questions that they would like to have answered on site. Uh, that could be done either once during the campaign or it could be done once every 10 days or two weeks that the campaign goes on, uh, which is uh, how the British uh, statute has actually uh, um, developed, I mean, the British uh, 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 regulatory agency has developed its guidance. Uh, ironically, the British statute is modeled after the National Labor Relations Act. I mean, they think they're implementing, uh, they were emphatic that they were borrowing our model and that they think they're implementing our concepts in terms of how to promote a, a free and fair and level playing field election. And their position was every 10 days that an election is going on, uh, uh, the uh, union will have this kind of access uh, during the election process, uh, not before it. And so I, I think that's one thing the board could be thinking about. I mean, I don't, don't know whether you want me to put all these things out here. Yeah, why don't we, we why there. don't we talk a little bit about that? Um, what 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 do you think? And my just my initial impression is, as a former appellate court attorney, the first thing I start thinking is whether if the board were to interpret Section Nine that way, whether courts would give it um, would defer to it under Chevron. Um, but what what do what do the other panelists think about um, about that as a p possibility? Um, well, un unfortunately, I am still a federal employee, um, and uh, I still have some labor law responsibilities um, as a prosecutor for a different agency. So I can't. I'm in a position where I can't make too many pronouncements on my personal views on on, on issues like this. But I do. I. I I do think that Section 9 is, is, a, is a fertile way to go, a way to look, because um, if, we get, if, if you're looking at it under unfair labor practice law, um, anything that implicates um, uh, employer speech issues is automatically going to throw you into 8C issues. Now, I, and that's not to say the 8C issue isn't there under Section 9, but it, Section 9... Um, only mentions unfair labor practice cases, or Section 8C, I'm sorry, only mentions evidence in unfair labor practice cases. So there certainly is an argument that it doesn't apply and that the, and that the First Amendment issues are of less concern when you're not talking about penalizing some, uh, someone with, a, uh, with an unfair labor practice finding. So in, in that way, I think that Section 9 may be a good place to look. Um, I think if I may, if you just allow, I don't know the answer with regard to Jim Brudney's uh, suggestion as Section 9 as a predicate for uh, enhanced access. Um, I think to bring it back to the point that I was um, trying to make earlier and to, and to reference a, a larger framework to, and then maybe bring it back to the specific question, um, is just the general notion of change at the NLRB. I happened to attend uh, a meeting in, um, in New York last week. Larry Cohen was there. Uh, Mark Pierce, one of the new board members, spoke. And the first question, the first question that was asked, uh, what do you think about oscillation or pendulums, pendulum swings at the NLRB? Uh, when I was appointed to the NLRB in 1985, I went back to New Haven, Connecticut to give a speech, and the first question that was asked was, what do you think about pendulum swings at the NLRB? Um, and I think both Ann and Jim have alluded to this, and, I, and, and this is related to this specific question, but this is a very important discussion for all of us to have uh, in the 75th a year of the NLRA. When is it appropriate to change rules? Is, is a sufficient predicate 
for change merely the fact that we have another array of political appointees. Dennis referred to politics. Um, uh, you know, it's the, I, I, when people complain about politics and the National Labor Relations Board, I've said this before, if you've heard me say it someplace else, forgive me, but um, it's like Casablanca when uh, Claude Rains, you remember, he's blowing his whistle, he's shutting the place down, Humphrey Bogart goes up to him protesting, uh, what, what's, what's the story, Louis, why are you shutting me down? And he says, I'm shocked shocked to find out that there's gambling going on here. <laughs> and of course, somebody comes up and proceeds to give him his proceeds from his, from his win. And um, it, it's, we are uncomfortable and we have done a poor job of accommodating the legal regime uh, that has been put in place, the administrative structure and the political structure. Uh, I do not believe that um, having studied uh, Kenneth Culp Davis and having had, he was still alive when I was appointed to the board, I had the opportunity, he was then in San Diego, to go out and speak to his class and to meet with him and talk to him. I don't really believe that that's what uh, administrative law had in mind when uh, there was this notion or this concept that we would have an agency with expertise, with people with experience, varying kinds of experience, and that experience would allow the agency, not bound by stare decisis, I'll say it one more time because there was a question about stare decisis last week in New York, not bound by stare decisis because the agency is, uh, is supposed to be able to adjust its rules when there has been some demonstration, as my good friends and colleagues from the board understand and know well, that the existing regime or rules do not work. So when you come as a board member, whether the issue is access that we're talking about or it's the Weingarten uh, rule in the non-union setting, do I have the right to have a fellow employee present? The question isn't, gee, I disagree with what Member Walsh did, I'm here now, he isn't, so I'm going to do it differently. That's not administrative law, as far as I'm concerned. That doesn't comply with the standards. And what, what we do want to have, I think, is a regime where we have more reliance on what has the experience of the board been in the administration of a particular rule. Does it further the purposes of the statute? If not, why not? And what should we do about it? And, and I think this is related directly to the question about the Section 9 access question as well with regard to, to um, uh, my good friend Dennis's comments about rulemaking. I think this is part of the criticism that I take seriously of the agency. One of the things that rulemaking surely allows, it seems to me, that the case-by-case -case adjudication has not done as well is, the, is to collect facts to collect adjudicative and legislative facts that would allow the agency to make a better policy choice with regard to that particular rule. If you're only making a choice based on adjudication, it seems to me you're cutting yourself short. And when you collect more facts, more legislative facts, the, it, it, it should, I think, in some measure, deal with this oscillation issue, but it's because you have a demonstrated record upon which you've made a reasonable determination. The board is entitled to deference if it's making a reasonable choice based on the record before it. And I think that those, uh, that, that kind of attention to detail and process at the agency will produce a better result. I think, I don't, I cannot predict what the answer would be to Jim Brudney's suggestion with regard to Section 9 and access, but I certainly can imagine a much more enlightened procedure uh, if the agency were to undertake that kind of a process. Well, before we, we go on to one of Jim's, um, his second um, solution or potential solution, I just want to follow. too grand. Yeah. <laughs> Area of inquiry. Area of inquiry. Um, I just want to follow up a little bit on that and combine some of those remarks um, about politics and also uh, fact-finding. Um, I guess I'm curious, well, when, when is oscillation appropriate? Obviously, the board can oscillate. There's no, it's not unlawful. It's perfectly lawful practice. But when is it appropriate? And 
along maybe I'm not sure if these are connected completely, but Ellen Dannon suggests that the board could, through adjudication, actually collect more facts. And Marshall, I think you're absolutely correct that the board, uh, the regions absolutely don't do that, and that the rulemaking rulemaking would force the board to engage in more, much more fact collecting of that type, sort of socio like harvesting sociological data. Um, Professor Dannon has suggested that in her book. And um, would that work? Or does anyone see some obstacles to doing that? Well, I, I think that th th this, this is a question that uh, we need to have some hard discussion about. If people are upset about oscillation, and well, they should be, it's because of the, the nature of the oscillation that we've had. I, I don't think one can fairly characterize the change in rules um, merely on the uh, inefficacy or the inefficiency of the existing rule. I mean, I think that one can clearly conclude uh, reasonably that uh, the only apparent justification for the change is that we have different people deciding what the rules should be. And that just simply is not consistent with administrative, roommate, or administrative norms. Uh, and I don't care whether you're a conservative or a liberal, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, that's a lousy basis for making a change. So when I read, for example, and the courts have to take some ownership, we have some very distinguished judges who I think have allowed this to happen. Uh, if I get the names wrong, forgive me, because the, the, some of these cases have, uh, the, the rules have flip-flopped so many times, but um, Harry Edwards' decision in the D.C. Circuit, accepting the board's uh, decision to, to not provide a, uh, a representative uh, in a non-union setting. Uh, his, his opinion starts out something like this, and, and we all know that Harry Edwards is a pretty bright guy. It starts out something like this. Well, there must be a change in personnel at the NLRB. Um, now, Judge Edwards doesn't need any lectures or instruction for me as to what the standard of review is. But I don't think it's unfair to suggest that the courts uh, could say, we don't think that there's been an adequate showing that the prior rule uh, didn't. And I'm not advocating this position because of the particular point in time where that rule was at that moment. Um, but I'm, but I, I don't think that the courts need acquiesce in that. And I don't think that the board members themselves should feel that they have the license to change the rule merely because, excuse me, merely because uh, they happen to disagree with it. My view would be, and, and I, I, I'm, I'm a little bit of a uh, captive of my own uh, experience, so forgive me. Uh, my good friend uh, Larry Cohen and I have talked about this decision many times. Take the Declawood decision that was decided uh, during the 80s by the board. We changed the rule with regard to the conversion doctrine. We eliminated the conversion doctrine. This is in the, in the construction industry where a pre-hire agreement somehow converts to a Section 9 relationship, a 9C relationship. Uh, why did we do it? Well, we had abundant evidence that um, we were spending weeks and months litigating cases in which we were trying to identify this magical moment in which a pre-hire relationship had turned into a full-blown uh, representation relationship and a Section 9 relationship. It didn't seem to work. And that, to me, is a very excellent example, not because I participated in it, but it was a very excellent example of what it is precisely that administrative law is supposed to be doing. Didn't work. We need to find a better rule. There were people at the board who said to us, you can't do this. It's been around for too long, the conversion doctrine. The Supreme Court has approved it. And there were some of us who had the view, well, yes, of course the Supreme Court has approved it because the prior rule was well-grounded, well-founded, and well-reasoned, and they deferred to it. That didn't mean that they precluded another rule. Uh, another example is are, 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 uh, units, the appropriate units in the healthcare industry. We initiated rulemaking uh, during the time I was there. It was, wasn't completed until after I left, but we were spending we had cases in which people went on the record for a year litigating what units are appropriate in the healthcare industry, clearly not uh, achieving statutory objectives. No, no reasonable agency 
could justify spending a year litigating what the units are if, if you're going to allow people to pursue uh, collective bargaining rights. Uh, it wasn't easy, it was difficult, but I think it's a good example of how the agency has well served administrative purposes, collected legislative facts. Uh, there were people who said these are never going to withstand scrutiny, and I think that they have. Uh, I, I can't tell you, I've heard some muttering in the recent past that uh, the units are, are no longer appropriate in every respect, but that's another issue for the board to take up. Another example of uh, accommodating the system uh, to um, what is required to further the principles of the statute. Um, I, go ahead, Jim. I guess I, I have a couple of thoughts in relation to both uh, Anne-Marie's question and Marshall's response. I mean, there is a certain amount of tension in administrative law terms between what Chevron stands for and the concept of oscillation. In other words, Chevron invites um, agencies to engage in what uh, is sometimes referred to as dynamic statutory interpretation. The idea of uh, the agency, I mean, we, if you take the most sort of powerful conceptual justification for Chevron, it's about agencies being politically accountable in ways that courts aren't. And therefore, what an agency does to update a statute, and there are specific examples of this outside of labor law and the Supreme Court's jurisprudence, is uh, to, in, to do something that Justice Scalia, for instance, uh, respects and even justifies in ways that he would never respect or justify uh, uh, a court engaging in that kind of updating. Uh, so um, I don't think that the issue is necessarily confined or uh, defined by whether some change has been made in the way the agency approaches a problem, uh, a statutory interpretation problem, if you will, or a purpose of problem. Uh, having said that, I think it's easier um, for a variety of reasons to think about the board's engagement in new kinds of thinking uh, with respect to areas that there isn't this um, kind of battleground littered uh, uh, history of precedents that have been discarded once, twice, six times. I mean, uh, I, I, as a labor law professor, um, uh, get a kick sometimes out of listing the whole Hollywood ceramics uh, history uh, and trying to get my students to understand uh, that it's all about who was president at what time. And uh, there, are, there are a variety of those examples that don't, I think, lend themselves to the kind of, um, I mean, I, I sort of stayed away from in my own thinking about what to suggest here. Uh, I, you know, graduate students, um, uh, Dana Metaldine, a variety of things where the court has been on, where the board has been uh, 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 involved in what we might call oscillation. Um, uh, but I do think uh, there's a sort of challenge here for the board. I, my own view about Dana Metaldine and the whole discussion of it uh, is that it doesn't simply reflect, and, and I don't have the privilege of knowing all of you uh, from the inside the way my two colleagues do, although I, my wife was a member of the uh, board's uh, staff with Chairman Stevens for several years, so I have some familiarity, but not nearly what uh, these two gentlemen do. Um, I, I think that the judgment implicit, or one of the judgments implicit in the Dana Metaldine thinking uh, must have been not simply and maybe even not primarily what one would call ideological, but what one might call territorial, uh, that the elections process has been the crown jewel of the board's administrative domain, responsibility, and success over a period of decades, and that there has been uh, a feeling that insofar as organizing is going on outside of that process, it's a fundamentally disrespectful development with, res with regard to the act itself. Um, 
and in so far as that might be true, and it's my projection at this point, and I'll be interested when we get to larger audience participation, I think it does suggest uh, uh, that the board would and should think about ways to make that election process more hospitable and user-friendly, if you will, to those who have uh, seemingly voted with their feet by opting out of it over the last 15 or 20 years. So that the, the whether it's the access issue or uh, any other issue that's being looked at, it needs to be looked at at least partly through the lens of how do the, the individuals and organizations that want to initiate efforts at organizing and collective bargaining come to feel not that they're going to win every case. I mean, this isn't about win rates uh, 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 in serious terms. It's about how likely is it that the process will feel fully fair and fully deliberative uh, as uh, many of those constituencies have felt it was in the past. I, I just want to make one comment about the, uh, the oscillation. I, um, <clears throat> I think that the um, that that the divided nature of the board is um, it, 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 it's it's just not going to change and, and unless and until the sharp divisions on the board change. I mean, and and that goes back again to my comments about the, uh, the the process of nominating and particularly the packaging of nominees and the view that this board is a is is a three to two board one way or the other. And that's the way we're going to package our nominees. That's the way we are going to. That's that's the way they're going to be confirmed. And and as long as we continue that, then we're going to have this kind of division. And when I say three to two board, I mean three. We're going to find three members who have one view of the act uh, and one agenda. And we're going to find two. And, and 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 then the other two will have the other view. And then when the administration changes, we're going to do it the other way. That's not the way the statute was set up, and that's the way it's evolved. And as long as we keep having that, for example, now, um, and, and I'm going to be somewhat blunt here, but um, I mean, this new board is faced with a group of decisions that I believe had a very radical view um, of the law, and and this new board has a different view. And I personally think it would be irresponsible of them not to address some of those decisions and the issues and the decisions that were made with an eye toward changing them. It would be irresponsible. But that's because of the way the boards have been put together. Um, and I, I think something has to change there. And I'm not sure that litigation is the way um, to develop the records, because the kind of litigation that, that agencies like the board does is just not that well suited for it. It's, there's no discovery. There's, I mean, um, you know, they're not used to doing Brandeis briefs, you know, for sure. And and, and I'm, I'm just not sure that that's the way to go. Um, but anyway, I just think some fundamental look has to be made to how the board itself is, is, is composed. Yeah, and I, I just very briefly, because I, I, th there are th three different issues here that it seems to me have been flagged, and they're all, you know, they're all of great interest, I think, to everybody in this room. Um, we're, we're talking about what I consider to be the, the, the the fundamental issue, and that is, what is the what are the premises for change? We're talking about um, the political process, and how does that either foster or exacerbate the problem or problems that we've had with regard to change? And then we're talking about the rule in a particular case, uh, which one may or may not, with which one may or may not agree. I mean, th th there are so many things that one could say. I would not. I, I don't think Jim was essentially saying this, but to the extent he, he may have been suggesting out of an excess of kindness that uh, um, um, care or concern for the election process uh, motivated uh, Dana Metaldine. I mean, just let's just take the, the last one first. It's the last thing I'll say about this case because I may be alone in this. Th th this is the thing that I don't understand about Dana Metaldine. We, we have, forget... The, the particular rationales that were set out. We have a statute that fosters, seeks to foster as one of its primary purposes, collective bargaining relationships, collaborative relationships. You're an employer, you don't want to have a collaborative relationship. 
Don't have it under the present. I'm talking about under the present regime. Don't have it. But if you do want to have it, we have an agency that will not foster it. What is the justification in the statute for that? It just it makes no sense. It just simply doesn't make any sense because it's not one is is highly inconsistent with the other. So I wouldn't be as generous as Jim has been in his uh, in his remarks in that regard. And uh, and I know I'm sure he has his own views, but uh, but just. With regard to these other two points, just very, very quickly, this, this is the old uh, statement, I think, that was uh, attributed to Gandhi, right? I mean, th th this is the issue of, of, of an, uh, in a world in which the rule of law is an eye for an eye, the whole world ends up blind. I mean, is this really, who's going to stop? Uh, and the irony of this is, this is precisely the kind of thing. I mean, Larry, Vicky, others uh, here who are such worthy advocates, they can tell you, these are precisely the kinds of things that we deal with in collective bargaining every day. You have a seven-week strike. You have a seven-month strike. You have two parties that have been on opposite sides of one another because they have what seem to be diametrically opposed interests. When is it going to end? Somebody's got to end it. Uh, so I don't know the answer to Dennis's very difficult question. He's saying, well, it seems to me that, you know, so much harm from his perspective with regard to some of these norms or rules has been done that something needs to be done to correct this. Well, um, one could, I think, reasonably predict that if, if one were to um, applaud that approach in that manner, in the very same manner, and not a, a different uh, approach, um, and that's why we want to have this important discussion in the 75th anniversary year, uh, the next group of people may feel just as strongly the other way. And so we're locked in this endless cycle of, uh, of everybody doing it, uh, of making change for, I think, a, an improper purpose. I think it's an improper purpose. So I guess I'd like to get back to the fundamental question, which is, why should it not be uh, that the rule in, in, as to whether or not one has a wine garden representative, just as an example, in a non-union setting, should not turn on whether Marshall Babson or Dennis Walsh uh, at, believes it a, a particular way. And the first opportunity he has to uh, speak to the issue, he's going to say, uh, I think that the rules should be different. I don't believe that's what administrative law requires or should tolerate. I believe that there should be a demonstrable uh, record that the rule in place has not served the purposes of the statute. If there is some showing that the rule in place has not worked and it so happens that a Democratic majority is on the board or a Republican majority is on the board and these people have expertise, the collective expertise of the agency, which is not just the individual's own views based on their own experience, it's the agency's cumulative experience as well. That's what expertise is. I, I, you'll, have, you'll forgive me and, and I, I apologize for saying this in this setting, but when I was uh, first on the board, I was invited to go to the NYU Labor Law Conference. In those days, uh, NLRA uh, law was so important to what everyone did. They, they would have four or 500 people, and all the board members would attend. And uh, I gave a, a comment. And it just so happens that the week before we had the conference, we're talking about 25 years ago, uh, Don Dotson, who was then the chairman of the NLRB, had given a speech somewhere in which he had opined that the agency, in his experience, didn't have any expertise whatsoever. <laughs> and so somebody uh, asked me, what did I think of that? I think it was Bruce Simon, actually, from Cohen, Weiss, and Simon. And so I said, uh, I thought that he had shot himself in the foot. Being, having been on the board for all of three or four months, that's how diplomatic I was at that point. I said I thought that, and it, I'll tell you, it made for a not very happy return. Um, I said I thought that um, he had shot himself in the foot because I don't view, I, I think the agency has extraordinary expertise. Uh, one may agree with its experience or not, but this is the, the agency's cumulative experience in administering that statute. 
I, I, someone from the audience yelled out, I will tell you, they, went, they yelled out, too bad he didn't aim a little higher. But I, 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 uh, I will always remember that because I do think that there's some fundamental misunderstanding uh, on both sides about what this issue of expertise means, what it means to come to a point of view. And I believe that we have to get our premises in order with regard to the changes. If you're going to make a change, even if you believe that the people who came before you uh, made the rule for bad reasons, political reasons, uh, no reasons, uh, let's establish a record going forward. Let's set new, higher standards if we can. And uh, let's require by, by deed that uh, everyone who comes after has to meet that higher standard. I want to open this up to the audience, but maybe, Jim, do you want to maybe give a little bit of, flesh out a little bit your other two areas of conversation, then we can get some comments from the audience? Um, a little bit. Uh, Marshall is well familiar with the second one of these since we um, exchanged views on it um, in a conference uh, a couple of months ago. but. Um, in brief, uh, this stems from uh, having spent some time looking at Phelps Dodge and Justice Frankfurter's uh, discussion of mitigation uh, and the extent to which he contemplated uh, considerable agency discretion in how uh, that mitigation inquiry could be integrated into the mandate of 10C, which he chanted over and over again in, in Phelps Dodge was to effectuate the policies of the act. And he referred to flexible procedural devices uh, that could be used to generate uh, um, uh, innovative uh, approaches to back pay awards. Uh, I spent some time reviewing the board's data uh, on back pay awards for wrongful discharge cases between 2004 and 2008, of which there are many. Uh, and it turns out that in settled cases, of which there are two major kinds, and I know I'm preaching to the converted here on what those are, uh, uh, the delay averages 9 to 18 months for wrongfully discharged employees to receive any back pay. For litigated cases, whether it goes to the Board or the Courts of Appeals, uh, the average wait is from 5 to 7 years. Uh, and those protracted time delays make it uh, impossible to return to the status quo that existed before fired individuals were fired. Uh, many surviving uh, employees are predictably chilled uh, from uh, voicing support for collective bargaining or for organizing by watching uh, months or years go by before uh, uh, their wrongfully discharged uh, uh, fellow employees are compensated. And obviously many fired workers also succumb to the pressure of settling uh, for far less than they're owed and that what, than what might be needed to effectuate the policies of the Act. So I think there is room, I, I'm quite confident there's room within the Supreme Court's jurisprudence uh, for the board to uh, con to contemplate uh, a mandatory minimum award uh, using Transmarine uh, as a model. And Transmarine, as you know, has been accepted uh, uh, by every court of appeals that has thought about it um, and is now in place for th three or four decades. Um, so, I, I mean, that's, uh, I mean, I, I, what I suggested in this uh, uh, earlier presentation was a, uh, a two-tiered mandatory minimum depending on whether it involves settled cases or litigated cases and, and then tried to think about what all the arguments are against it. We can spend more time thinking about that if you want. Um, uh, the issue of uh, misclassifying employees, I mean, we have a definition of independent contractor, but not necessarily, I mean, we don't have a definition, we have a concept of independent contractor under the Act, but we don't have uh, a, an amplification of that concept uh, in terms of uh, elaborated guidance and reasoning about what does or doesn't qualify. I mean, there are, under the Fair Labor Standards Act, uh, you know, six-part tests, eight-part tests. Courts of Appeals have come up with a variety of ways of thinking about this. And uh, Seth referred to uh, uh, efforts to generate, I mean, there are a lot of different ways to think about this, but I, I, I could imagine uh, the board trying to address uh, what has become a huge issue in American workplace law generally, which is the number of employers who evade uh, 
tax consequences as well as wage consequences and benefits consequences of employing or having the individuals who work for them be designated as employees. That creates enormous competitive disadvantages for employers who play by the rules and actually are paying FICA and a variety of other, I mean, forget about the wage aspects for a moment, just the sort of tax and other consequences of how many people are no longer part of the employee workforce. And that seems to me something that the NLRB hasn't been heard from to nearly the extent that other agencies have who are trying to wrestle with this problem. And before we open it, just one very, very, very briefly, just on this, on the Dana Medaldine thing, it just occurred to me because I've heard about this. On the question of employee choice, I've negotiated many neutrality agreements and recognition agreements over the last dozen years. The parties are not unmindful of the importance of choice and preserving free choice. And so without getting into a more detailed discussion, unless someone wants to, the notion that the mere entering into of a neutrality and card check agreement somehow means that there is no choice, I think is, in my experience, I'm only talking from my experience, is not correct. It's just simply not correct. Now, could there be? Of course. We know that that's possible. But I've not myself sat down with business managers or union representatives who are either disinterested or disregarding of employee choice. Sorry. And many of these ideas are going to be fleshed out also in the Florida International Law Review Symposium on the 75th anniversary, in honor of the 75th anniversary, where former board member Acosta is actually the dean. So I'm sure you're all looking forward to that reading. At least I am. But I think there was a question over here. So can you wait for the microphone? And would you please identify yourself for the audience? Larry Cohen, union lawyer. I have two comments. The first, I have to agree with Marshall that Jim's view of Dana is, I think, a little bit charitable. And you don't have to look any further than to read a decision of the board the very same day. The name is something like Wirtland Nursing. And in Dana, the board majority's view is that elections are sacrosanct. In Wirtland, the board said, well, a petition showing the employees don't want the union anymore is good enough for us. I think that shows the true cynicism of what those decisions were all about. Secondly, I'd like to take up Dennis's point that the packaging is part of the real evil here. And as far back as 84, Vicki and I wrote an article in which we proposed a different system of selecting board members. I'm old enough to remember the days when you got a Doc Pinello out of the board, a Howard Jenkins from the Labor Department, John Fanning came from the Defense Department. I think the three and two back and forth swings should be corrected. And one way to do that might be this. If labor and management could just get together and agree that for their experience, you would have one union lawyer and one management lawyer on the board, no more. And all the rest would have to come from within the board or other agencies or putting the Gould experience aside, perhaps academia, that you would end up with a much better board and certainly a lot less pendulum swings. Other questions? Can I comment on that briefly? Sure. I don't think it is a bad idea. But I also think that the statute actually has set up a system for choosing board members. And that is that one should be chosen each year, and only one. And if we can get some kind of agreement from labor and management on that one person each year, I think we'd be much better off. We'd have more institutional memory. And I agree with you. And more stability. And I think more 
ability to work together as a group. Um, if we had more Doc Pinellos and John Fannings and John Truesdales and, and even John Higgins, you know, I mean, um, if, 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 if we had more of them, we'd really be able to work together a lot better. Right here. Kathy Krieger, a union lawyer. Um, I have a question. I guess I'll pitch it to Marshall and to um, those who have worked in the private sector. Um, is there an intersection between what S Seth Harris spoke about, which is the um, elaboration of employment law as a series of federal rights-oriented statutes, and the evolution we've seen? I mean, 75 years ago, 50 years ago even, uh, labor relations law was made up a lot, on, especially on the employer side, of people who had an investment in um, what, for lack of a better word, might be considered a private, privately elaborated system of, of labor law, both before, the, both in the collective bargaining sector and in arbitration. And the labor board was designed to keep the parties in that um, sector where they could make their own rules and enforce them. Um, fast forward, we have a culture where on the management side, uh, employment law practice is made up of people who love to litigate. And all the investment is, I think, in uh, litigating more and more. Not necessarily, and, and much of, I think, where doctrine is going is driven by um, litigators who sell employers, if you will, on the fact that you belong in the courts, not um, you know, not before the labor board. We're not going to settle it in collective bargaining. We're not going to settle in arbitration. And so, you know, I may to speak to people in a law firm where, on their commercial side. Um, they're in relationship agreements. Everything is arbitrated. Even arbitrability questions, not a problem. That's the regime they like. They like to stay out of court. On the labor side, same law firms, their employment practice um, will litigate everything, um, including whether you have to go to arbitration. And you know they can't stand the idea that you could actually have a partnership contract that's um, made up of equal power relations and that's settled internally. Um, and I don't know whether it's cause and effect or, or what, but I, I was just wondering if anybody has similar reactions and um, uh, a sense of we're getting what we privilege, if you will, in, in this um, run to the courts and away from um, what we thought of as the labor relations sphere in which disputes are settled. Well, I don't know that I am uh, qualified to answer the question. I think it's a great question. and. Um, I, as somebody who's spent, it's, it's coming on 40 years now doing this, I, um, I have a lot of mixed feelings about what accounts for why we are where we are. I mean, part, surely one observation that all of us in this room can share is, is that uh, this adversariness, uh, these polar positions uh, that are set out that manifest themselves, whether it's an agency practice, uh, in, in the political scheme, uh, we happen to be, unfortunately, I think, uh, for all of us, not just in the United States, but just in the world, we happen to be in a situation where um, we have a lot of people on, at the extremes who are dictating not only the discussion and the terms of the discussion, but uh, the quality of life that we're all forced to live uh, because of their polar positions. And this is this is really tough. I mean, it. It's either my way or no way. I mean, how many of us have heard this? And you, you fill in the, the topic. Um, one of my favorite New Yorker cartoons, uh, on, to, to bring it home to, to lawyers and lawyering, which is part of, I think, what Kathy was suggesting, one of my favorite New Yorker cartoons, again, forgive me, uh, two young lawyers are sitting with their briefcases in front of John Smith's desk. He has a sign that says, John Smith, CEO. And behind him, through the window, you can see this oil tank farm. It says, Smith Oil Company. And these two young lawyers are saying uh, to Mr. Smith, we're going to make great law in this case. And, and Smith says, well, you know, it's funny because the only thing I ever wanted to make was oil. Um, the short answer is, is that a lot, a lot of lawyers don't get it. Um, the purpose of what we do is not to be, I mean, we all love to make law. I mean, this is what we're trained to do and love to do, but uh, we're here to serve other purposes. 
and to facilitate, in the case of the Labor Act, to facilitate these arrangements and relationships. And so if you're litigating them all the time, instead of thinking about how you can avoid litigating and find the areas in common, uh, you can make a living doing it, maybe more than a living doing it, but you're not really serving purposes. <laughs> I, I, this is too large a discussion, uh, too large a topic to have a discussion here, much less resolve it, uh, as to what accounts for this, but uh, it's something, you know, other than trying to find what's, you know, the greater good for the greater number. There's a lot of uh, self-interest, and uh, so, just without saying too much more about this, I mean, I think that um, there are people who are willing to work on these relationships. There are people who are willing to make them work. I, I really believe what I, what I told you at the outset. I have had enough substantive experience in the recent years to believe that this system can work. Uh, if you're willing to allow the parties to sit down, that if, if the, their representatives are willing to allow them to sit down and find those areas where their interests coincide. There's a great book written by a guy named Robert Wright, W-R-I-G-H-T. I was misquoted once as quoting Robert Reich, and it's not Robert Reich, it's Robert Wright. It's called Non-Zero Sum. I don't know if you've read it. Read it. It's a great book. It's not very long. But basically the thesis is, is that if we spent more time, and there's a lot of historical support for this, if we spent more time understanding where our interests coincide instead of focusing so much on the differences, uh, that we would uh, uh, make a lot more progress. I guess I would share your view, Kathy, about what the sort of big picture looks like at this point. I, I think there may be two separate at least two separate dynamics going on. I mean, one is the thing that Seth and others have, many people have talked about, which is as, as you shift from government, fr from a regulation of the workplace through private negotiation to regulation of the workplace through positive law, whether that is statutes uh, or litigation about statutes, uh, you change uh, uh, cultures in all sorts of subtle and and less subtle ways. I mean, I don't think that it's only the management side uh, uh, that now believes that courts are the answer. I mean, I think uh, there is, there's a civil rights bar. There's a variety of ways in which uh, this has become uh, the uh, channel that people pursue uh, far more. Uh, and, and also that when you talk about situations like Circuit City and the notion that there is this so-called option for uh, alternative dispute resolution, it's perceived uh, uh, with some justification to be uh, not a terribly fair option, not remotely equivalent to the option of two arm's length uh, uh, sophisticated players in a union management setting. Um, but I also think a piece of this, a separate piece of this, is the change in the way employers uh, in this country view unions. Uh, I mean, if we take a look at the development of the politicization of the board, there were management attorneys on the board before 1980. Um, and there was some concern expressed by the labor movement about that. Uh, but there was basically the group of people who were management attorneys on the board before 1980 were also people who had uh, a commitment to the collective bargaining norms of the act and whose clients both before and after they served on the board, were people who negotiated regularly uh, uh, as part of a collective bargaining world. Uh, that changed, uh, uh, Marshall being a notable exception, uh, uh, after 1980 uh, with a number of people who were appointed whose clients were union avoidance uh, businesses. Uh, uh, and they had a different perspective on what the Act's role was. Um, you know, one of the first things I did when I was in academia was to do this crazy idea of uh, looking at all the appellate court judges in the country and how they looked, how they reviewed NLRB decisions over a seven or eight year period and I killed a lot of law students uh, 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 gathering research about it and one of the things that I found uh, was that um, during this period which was 1985 to 92 so it was mostly a pre-1980 set of judges, uh, judges who had management side uh, labor law experience before they joined the circuit courts were significantly more likely 
to support employees and unions in litigation in decisions than the norm and that reflected not in my view because I'm a charitable person not in my view their perception like criminal defense lawyers that their clients are guilty anyway and so now I know I'm not required to represent them anymore I think what it reflected was a faith in the act and its processes that would be vindicated in ways and and in the notions the norms of group action that were vindicated in ways that it's much harder to find in the 20 to 25 years since then so I think two different things are going on that are creating that kind of result at least two we have only five minutes left so I think we have time for one more question with some short responses if anyone would like to please remember to identify yourself I'm Joel Dillard I work at the National Labor Relations Board my question is about Seth Harris talked about the culture of compliance and other culture the culture of making economic analysis of whether to comply with the law and the Labor Department's efforts to encourage more employers to get into a virtuous cycle culture of compliance how could the board do a better job of encouraging a culture of compliance with the National Labor Relations Act and and I guess historically how well has the board done well yeah let me I I don't know that any of us in the time remaining can answer the question which is a good question I but I I appreciate your asking it because it there is one I very much enjoyed Seth's comments the thing but I heard this from Priscilla Smith last week in New York she spoke also at the same meeting about this segment I don't know what percentage is ascribed to it of employers who make a calculation that it's in their economic interest to violate the law I just have to tell you I've been doing this for a long time I I've seen some pretty bad people out there on on the employer side I I don't think that this is common I mean I I really do not believe it and so you know if I had the opportunity to sit down and have a discussion with Seth or with Priscilla I I'd want to know what what's the basis for believing that there are people who sit down with pencil and paper and decide well you know if I litigate this case at the NLRB for five years you know Jim's done a lot of research with regard to back pay you know, I'll keep the five million in my pocket for five years, even at the simple interest rate. I'm going to make out as a bandito because I can invest that with, uh, you know, a hedge fund and get, you know, forty percent. I, I don't know. I, I just, I, I, just I, say- I just don't know the answer to that. But I just want you to know, from my experience, it's rare, and that there. I, I really, I'll just finish this way by saying that. With regard to these difficult kinds of issues, uh, you know, what accounts for why we are where we are with regard to some of these regimes and the enforcement regimes and the lack of success? Um, I'm sure there's a multiple, multi, there are a multiplicity of, of, of explanations, but I just, I, in my own experience, I'm just sharing with you my experience. I have not had, uh, it's not common for me to find employers who are doing that calculation. The only thing I was going to say, and I want to give Dennis a chance, is they wouldn't tell an ethical lawyer like you if they were calculating. Yeah, yeah, I I just have a kind of a simplistic response, but um, and it's and it's based on, you know, I'm with an agency now. I've been with another different agency now for about four months, and um, they they have an entirely different focus, Um, and, and it's a smaller. And, it, and it's a smaller constituency, I would, you know, for the FLRA, and it's just the federal employees. It's a much smaller constituency, so it's easier to do it. But their their focus is much more on education than it is on um, on, on prosecution. Um, they they see it as part of their actual mission to go out and 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 educate both sides what their rights and obligations are under under the statute. And you and and I was just struck by this because I've you know I've been with the labor board for 25 years I never heard the word practically you know education um, and I don't know whether it's something that can be done more and 
with the with the resources that they have and the, con the large constituency that they have, but it seems to help in the in the federal workforce. The fact that that we we have people out there actually um, educating people, um, and and I was just struck by that, and 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 maybe it's something. For example, what is so radical about the idea? That, that employers should be required to post a notice of employee rights. I mean, I, you know, there's been a proposal before the board since 1993 on that issue. What is so radical? What is so awful about educating employees about their rights under the statute? I, you know, I just don't, I, I don't get it. Um, it's, and it's part of the polarization, I guess, that, 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 that there's so much resistance to that. But anyway, that's just a thought. Well, um, we can just sum up by saying, perhaps, Dennis, you put it well by saying a lot of this has to do with politics. And maybe we we don't know what the future of the NLRA is, but we do know there, there will continue to be a lot of politicking. Um, I just want to thank Caroline and ACS for this um, really important symposium on um, the future of the National Labor Relations Act. And, and I think it is important that we pause and think about where, especially those of us who love labor law and think it's important um, to think about where labor law is going. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Pleasure. Very good to see you. Good to see you. Yes. Appreciate it.